Well, I've said it many times on the show before, the best storytellers are lawyers. And for the second time in as many weeks, uh, we have a, a new novelist with us today on the show uh, who uh, is also an attorney, the author of this book, The Darlings, uh, coming to us, I believe, from her home in, uh, in New York. Christina Alger, welcome. Thank you. This is your home, right? It's beautiful. It is. <laughs> Thank it's, you. So, uh, Christina, I, I got to tell you, I really enjoyed the book. Uh, I really liked reading it. It is a, uh, I guess I'd call it a financial thriller, family drama, kind of uh, uh, folded into one. As with many of these types of books, I can't talk too much about the whole story because I don't want to spoil it for people who haven't read it yet, obviously. Um, but um, just to, to summarize, it's about a, uh, a family, they're in New York, they're in the world of high finance, it's right after the 2008 financial uh, collapse, uh, Lehman Brothers is down, AIG is down, uh, and people start freaking out. And this family, uh, who's uh, the main figure, is, uh, is the dad, and he's running a, a $14, $15 billion uh, fund of hedge funds, or a hedge fund, a fund of funds, I should say. And, um, and things start to go uh, horribly wrong. Is there anything else you'd like to put in there um, just so we can get the synopsis of the story that you feel comfortable telling people about? Um, no, I mean, that's, that's a great synopsis. It is hard to talk about the book um, if, you know, not giving anything away because it takes place over five days. So it's sort of a compressed timetable and things happen very quickly and go awry very quickly. So um, it's a little bit hard to talk about it without getting, giving away the plot, but, um, but I think you got it. Well, I'll slide in a little bit then. Um, there is uh, about a third of this fund is managed by uh, another fund, which turns out to be kind of possibly uh, like a Madoff style Ponzi scheme. And as I'm reading this book, I'm, you know, I'm, I want to feel bad for these people, but I don't. You know, I'm like, <laughs> just, just they don't give a crap about Here's the, here's the thing that really struck me throughout the entire book. Not a second, and, and of course this is so based on a reality and uh, in many ways factual, which we'll get to in a moment, based upon your background. Um, not for a second do any of the characters feel any remorse about the people down the line. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's just like even the clients themselves, who of course are money managers and maybe uh, uh, institutional funds, you know, it's like, ah, well, they'll be angry. But n there's not a, not a thought for a second about, wow, you know, what does that mean for someone's 401k or anything down the line? Um, since you, I, you have a lot of experience in, in this field coming from the world of finance and from law and your family uh, being, uh, having their own uh, fund, actually. Is that really true, do you feel, that, that, that these types of people just don't care? Well, I guess I, I think what I would say is that it does, as the book takes place in a short time frame, I think their immediate thought is to their family, right? Because their family fund is collapsing, their family is, you know, sort of collapsing along with it, and their first thought is kind of self-preservation, um, which possibly makes them seem slightly unsympathetic, but, you know, it is only five days, sort of at the very beginning of this crisis. Um, and I, I actually found the characters to be sympathetic in the sense that they're very committed to each other. Um, you know, Carter Darling is um, sort of a deeply flawed uh, financier, but he's, he's very committed to his family and to his daughters. And I, I found the humanity to be there and the sort of interpersonal relationships between the family. But... Um, but there is there is very little thought to the sort of outside world, and you know um, they have they live in a very insulated world where they don't think a lot about the investors that are also losing money alongside them. And, and I'll give you that. And and the a couple of things that were crossing my mind is that it's almost like The Sopranos when yeah. it comes to you know family um, and you know maybe willing to give up other family members for the better of the entire family. Um, but it's uh, it's almost like. Park Avenue porn is kind of the way I would describe it. Is that fair? Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I actually, you know, it's funny. I've talked um, to a lot of people. A lot of people have compared it to The Sopranos, and I think it's pretty accurate. You know, it's this family business, and you sort of forget. They sort of, they forgive themselves and forget what the ramifications of their actions are. You know, they sort of create this world, and 
it's really a world that is entirely turns on, you know, providing for their family without a lot of thought um, to the sort of moral and ethical implications of their work. But, um, but I think it's a neat comparison. I love this one, so. And what's interesting about the story and about your story is that you have actually lived uh uh, in a way, part of this life, you come from uh, a financial a family who has a has a, a family run business. Um, you've uh, you've been an analyst at Goldman Sachs, uh, an attorney at a prestigious law firm. Um, how much you know? You've have you actually ridden in the Escalades and you've been in the parties <laughs> and 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 you've gossiped like uh, like many of these women, but you've also been the hard hitting attorney who takes no crap. <laughs> it's well, you know, it's it's a much sexier version of my life, I guess. So people, it's funny. People always ask me if the family is based on my family, which I find amusing because if my family was as wildly corrupt as these people, I would not have the courage to write about it. But uh, but I did grow up around a family business and I grew up in New York City. And um, so a lot of, you know, the book is kind of based loosely on my own experience, I guess. But, um, you know, there's sort of moments of tongue in cheek humor about it. And it's it's definitely a um, kind of a sexier version of, you know, my, my small one bedroom apartment here, so. <laughs> How long were you at Goldman? I was at Goldman um, right after college, so I did the analyst program. I graduated in 2002, uh, went to Goldman, did the two-year analyst program, and then went to law school, and then was practicing law while I wrote this book. So I started writing the book around the time the book takes place, which is the fall of 2008. And I, but I thought that once the squid sucks you in, you can never get out. <laughs> I mean, it's like, how, how did they let you out? They, you know, it's funny. I'm actually, I'm, I'm getting married in five weeks, and I'm, I'm marrying someone from my analyst class at Goldman. So I don't know if they completely let me go, but um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it was a great place actually to learn. I, I really needed a quick education in finance. Um, I, I was an English major in college, and um, so Goldman was a great kind of boot camp for that. But I never thought I would stay kind of in finance. My sort of goal was always to, uh, to go to law school. So. What are your feelings about what people say about Goldman these days? I mean, certainly what has trickled down to Main Street uh, is, you know, these guys run the world, they don't care about their clients. In fact, you just said that if your family was like this, you'd, you'd, you'd hate it. I mean, uh, what's your feeling about Goldman? You know, I, um, it's, I mean, it's certainly a timely topic with, you know, the op-ed that came out in the Times um, just recently, but um, I, had, I had a good experience there. I, I thought, you know, my colleagues there were incredibly intelligent and actually on the whole from what I was hearing from people at other banks, it was a pretty sort of uh, respectful uh, culture, but, um, but I also wasn't there for very long. And <laughs> so, you know, I think it, it may have changed since 2004. Um, but you know, they, they certainly have um, a PR problem that I think they should address because I just every time they're in the news, it's something that's just, you know, it gets worse and worse and worse for them. So I think it speaks more to the kind of resentment of Wall Street generally and Goldman sort of, um, I think, in some ways, a little bit of a punching bag for, for that. You say 2004 because that's when Blank Fine came in? Is it, was that the change? <laughs> no, that's because that's when I left Goldman. Oh, okay. There's <laughs> <No. laughs> that guy doing God's work. Yeah, that's the no, guy that messed it all right, up. Right, I know. See, this is what I mean about their PR problem. I mean, whoever let him say that. <laughs> so, so do you think that... Um, who is the audience for this book? Because, again, and, and I, I have a personal opinion. I think that everyone should read it because... Uh, love it or hate it, and with the, you know the good PR, the bad PR of of Wall Street and the financial industry. On the one hand, I can just, I, as I said, you know Park Avenue porn. I can see women going, "Oh, this is great. Oh yes, I, oh yeah, she's just like that bitch over there." Eh. And on the other hand, I can see people reading like, "Wow, these people are, have no. They're not in touch with reality." Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I. I actually started writing it for myself. Um, I, I never thought it would be published. It was sort of a side project. And I was mostly writing it because I was, you know, I thought what was going on during that period was just so insane. And there was a lot of very good nonfiction about it, but there wasn't a lot of fiction. And um, and I also think, you know, lawyers tend to to scoff at legal, legal thrillers a lot because it's not necessarily accurate or reflective of their own experience. And so I was trying to make it, I guess, feel real and accurate for people that, you know, were from New York and worked in the industry. 
but um, but hopefully other people find it fun and you know um, as you say like for whatever reason they they pick it up that's that's great you know if it's for reading about the parties or this sort of more financial crime element of it that's that's awesome. Do you get people coming up to you saying? Um, yeah, like you're a Judas. I can't believe you wrote this. You know, you, you made us look so bad. No, you know, it's, a lot of people have asked me, like, do people hate you? Do you know? Do people see themselves in the book? And and I have, I haven't. You know, if they do, they haven't let me know. So um, I think it's it's fictionalized enough that hopefully I haven't uh, upset anyone too much. And uh, <laughs> um, you know, and I, what I hope is that people who are from New York and actually, you know, have some we're living in New York or working on Wall Street during that period will find it to be kind of accurate and fun for that reason. Yeah, well, you know, I've been in, I've been in the world of high finance. I've, I took a company public, so I can tell you know a lot, all of the legalities and the technicalities of the book. I think are spot on. At least nothing that, that I can note. Right down to the to the backdating. You know, it's a it's a perfect practice in the legal profession. This backdating of stuff is awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. It's um, it's it's good. It's, it, I'm glad to hear that because it's it's a little bit hard. You know, sometimes legalese gets pretty dry. Um, financial crime can get pretty dry pretty quickly. So it's sort of a fine balance between making it, uh, you know, the, the plot move along and also not, you know, talking down to the readership. So. Now, from reading your bio, I know that you always wanted to write uh, as a young girl, and you would dictate to your mom, and she would write down all these stories. Which I think it's beautiful. And so you actually did it. I mean, and, and this book is uh, it's getting, you know, everyone loves it. Um, of course, it's all the New York elites who love it. You know, like, oh, this is perfect. Um, but, you know, it's straight into the LA Times bestseller list. Congratulations on that. Um, I mean, what an interesting decision. Although, as I said, as I started off with, I think lawyers make the best storytellers because that's, you know, essentially a big part of what you do. Um, what was it that made you just say, okay, I'm really going to do it? You know, as I said, I mean, when you say like, who, you know, who was I writing for? I think, I think the cool part was that I was, I was really writing for myself. It was totally to entertain myself. I was working crazy hours. I was a bankruptcy attorney during that period. So my work was, um, you were busy. <laughs> yeah, I was I was busy. So, um, but you know, I think I I needed a creative release, and it was just a fun side project. And so I wasn't thinking too much about you know who's going to read it, how will I you know sell it, how will I package it, um, none of that. So I just I wrote it for fun, and um, along the way, a friend who's a writer picked it up or asked me to read. You know, she knew I was working on something, and and she liked it and passed it on to her agent and it sort of went from there. But, um, but it's been like a, it's like a dream come true for me. It's really fun. So it's just, uh, it's, it's cool that I'm, I'm sort of finally at this place that I had hoped to be at for a long time. Oh, very good. And, and you know, you, as you said, you wrote this uh, while it was actually happening uh, in 2008. So um, who did you build the hours to? <laughs> I know. Well, it was actually funny when I did my first reading. I was at Barnes and Noble, and a bunch of the partners that I worked with came to hear me read, which was wonderful. And the first question was like, "How did you find the time to do this?" And I was like, "Well, I don't know if I can answer that question accurately with uh, my boss sitting in front of me." But uh, <laughs> you know, I just um, I was. It's funny being a lawyer. You when you're traveling, you have actually kind of a strange amount of downtime in hotel rooms and like on flights and stuff with. A laptop in front of you, and um, I guess instead of sleeping or going to the gym, that was sort of my my escape from work. So, stop but I did with the, actually, stop I with the not going to the gym. You go to the gym. <laughs> I can tell. So yeah, I it was really like a weekend project, and then uh, I left. I did leave my law firm when we started editing, which I think uh, was a good decision because I think it would have taken me about fifteen years at that pace to get it done. So um, it was. Uh, it was a labor of love. So, um, you know, of course, everyone always says, you know, oh, how much of this is based upon your personal life? And I think you've probably answered that even in this interview, but in, in many other interviews that, yeah, I mean, there's always similarities and things that cross over. There is a couple pages in here, though, that really, I think, did come from your personal experience about 9-11. Yes, um, you know, I've, I've gotten a lot of questions about that particular passage and um, why you know I chose to put it in our and it was a pretty I mean I made a very deliberate decision to um, I you know my father died on 9/11 so it's has sort of personal significance to me and I didn't want it to be like the focus of the book in any way simply because it's a personal experience but I did think if you're writing a post 9/11 book set in New York it's really hard to get 350 pages in without mentioning it I just think it's a really large part of the fabric of the city still. And 
So I thought it sort of merited mention in some way. And these people, um, you know, have it touched their lives in some way, in a tangible way, because I think that's sort of realistic for, you know, most of us who are living in Manhattan at this point. So that was sort of how I came to include it in the way that I did. Well, those, I, I'll tell you, those, those few pages really jumped out. There was some stuff in there that uh, you don't think of. I wasn't in Manhattan when it happened. Uh, there's some things that jump out. Um, like, oh, really? I hadn't really considered that, you know, in the days after. And it was a very, it was actually, it was quite beautiful. And I didn't uh, know about your father until after I started doing some research. Um, now, of course, the big question, what are you going to do for the follow-up? Because now, you know, <laughs> now you wrote about something that actually happened and you had a lot of experience with. You're going to stay in this field with your writing, do you think? I know it's I'm I you know I I joke with uh, friends of mine that I like obviously lack imagination because I just you know write in what I know so I guess my next book I think will probably stay in I, I'm working on something now and I kind of like writing about Manhattan now it's it's fun for me and I feel like it's a uh, you know I sort of um, it's a way of kind of examining my own uh, you know childhood and. My life now, and so it's it's enjoyable, and maybe sometime in the future I'll get out of my little comfort zone. But for now, I'm writing a book um, that turns around Bill Robertson, who's the district attorney in this first book. So oh, good. So you're going to go after the real douchebags, yeah. a level higher. <laughs> I was going to ask you about Love that. That. that would be perfect. You know, you got to get into the political side, into all the deal making, just the IMF, World Bank. If you can just do something about that, that'd be awesome. Yeah, there's there's endless there's endless douchebaggery in New York. <laughs> Good word. <laughs> well, uh, Christina, once again, uh, congratulations. Uh, the book is called The Darlings. It is, uh, it's a great read. It's a fun read. It's, uh, it's a fast read. Uh, your writing is, uh, is fantastic. I think your character you. development really, really good. Uh, and I appreciate you coming on. I can't wait until uh, you know, we see what you come out with next. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you.